Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Kenneth Paul Tan, and I am the Vice Dean of Academic Affairs at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this public lecture, which we are organizing in collaboration with Asian Urban Lab. Uh, the mission of the LKY School is to educate and train the next generation of Asian policymakers and leaders with the objective of raising standards of governance throughout the region, improving the lives of re the region's people, and in so doing, contribute to the transformation of Asia. Uh, we are a school that values scholarship and learning, whose principal impact is to sharpen critical analytical sensibilities and equip leaders at all levels with the capacity to bring positive change in the world. It is therefore fitting that we should invite Edward Soja to deliver today's public lecture. Professor Soja's work, as we all know, has over the decades been a masterful rendition of theoretical sophistication and empirical groundedness, both aimed at strategizing for social and political action. This public lecture kicks off a series of lectures and workshops in Singapore and Jakarta that is part of a research project on spatial justice in Asian cities. There will be a whole day workshop tomorrow featuring papers that explore Professor Soja's work in the specific context of Singapore. Uh, to introduce Professor Soja, I am equally pleased to welcome on stage uh, William Lim, uh, he's another action-oriented theorist whose contributions to architecture, urbanism, and culture in Asia are well known to many. So, William. Historically, the term and modern concept of social justice has evolved over time since the mid-80s in the 19th century. The right of the city was a notion that was first conceived in 1968 by Henry the Frit. With contemporary reconceptualizations, broader interpretations of the right of the city have been made in academic, polit politics, and critical urban discourse. David Harvey, a distinguished scholar on social justice, points out that, quote, what kind of city we want cannot be divorced from that or what kind of social ties, relationship to nature, lifestyle, technology, and aesthetic values we desire, unquote. In his recent book, he also examines the unhealthy relationship formed between private capital surplus and exploitative urbanization. In a recent conference, Harvey emphasizes the need to, quote, to take command of the capitalist surplus absorption problem, socialize the capital surplus, and use it to meet social needs. Every soldier in seeking spatial justice and other writings has established himself as a key note, key figure in the discourse of spatial justice. The concept of spatial justice is complex and has multiple interlocking ideas. Broadly, I have identified three main issues as follows. One, Soja has for many years contested the privileging of mainstream social sciences, philosophy and history over geography, in thinking about justice. In recent years, quote, a new and different approach about space and spatiality has been emerging, and a rebalancing is beginning to occur between social, historical, and spatial perspectives. Two, soldiers sought to differentiate spatial justice not merely as a subset of social justice or as, quote, a substitute alternative for social, economic, or other forms of justice, 
but rather a way of looking at justice from the critical spatial perspective, unquote. <laughs> Furthermore, he emphasized and practically states that, quote, capitalism is not the only issue, nor should we reduce the causes of all injustice purely to the demand of capitalist accumulation. Three, Soja has also demonstrated that the struggle over the right to the city and the search of spatial justice must be inclusive and go beyond battling the domination of the rich and powerful. The inclusiveness should identify and vigorously contest many other social forces, such as racism, religious exclusiveness, gender discrimination, as well as the often well-intentioned class-oriented planning regulations. Four, the vigorous inclusive effort to foster a collective political consciousness is needed to facilitate meaningful grassroots participation, going beyond the limitation of well-intentioned, top-down official approach to create a sense of collective solidarity spending across different political ideologies and to challenge problems in the contemporary world from injustice, in income disparity, and climatic crisis. And five, all who are oppressed, subjugated, or economic exploited are to some degree suffering from the effects of unjust geographies, unquote. As injustice often created, embedded, and maintained in space, urban commons and public space should be considered as a key criteria towards achieving spatial justice. We need to maximize the fruition and to accessibility of public space and lower the barriers for interaction and enabling citizens to choose where, when, and how with whom to interact. In the area between two world wars, Marxist-oriented theorists identify social justice as the effective ideological instrument of class struggle to con test capitalist exploitation and large income gap between classes. The establishment of welfare state in Western Europe and to some extent the United States post-World War II since the 1950s to 70s substantially reduced the income gap. During this period, progressive people in these countries also contested inequality and injustice a broad cultural revolution agenda, embracing gender, sexual orientation, race, and religion. However, the event of neoliberalism and global capitalism in the period after the 1980s have now created serious widening income inequality within and between countries. The United States and Singapore have the highest income disparity among the rich countries. The share of national income going to the richest 1% of Americans have doubled since 1980, from 10% to 20%. A recent economic, a Western economic and housing crisis can lead to strong reactions and demanding the need for an inevitable restructuring of existing system based on excessive greed. By the period of 1980, emerging economies have grown at a historically unprecedented space, with China leading the pack. The rebalance of global influence has quickly become increasingly unstoppable. In the meantime, cities in emerging economies are often being built and expanded in a discouraging and chaotic manner. They are now more spatially fragmented more socially divisive and more restrictive for the poor and the use of available public space. The income gap has increased everywhere around the world, particularly in the emerging economies. 
United Nations in, 19, in the year 2007 had recognized this problem and proclaimed a World Day of Social Justice as a universal human right to chart a development path that leads to greater social justice than the future we want. The urban question posed by Leffrey, Harvey, and Castell since the late 80, 60s now require urgent fundamental reassessment, arising from recent unprecedented explosive urbanization and related development in the emerging economies. It is in this context that many emerging economies have taken seriously to redress injustices. In the last two decades, some countries in South America have reduced a very high income disparity by giving positive financial support to the poor. In Asia, South Korea and Taiwan have also taken strong measures to provide better income equality and to facilitate active citizen participation. In recent years, impact of information and communication technology, ICT, has generated critical debates and positive imp improvements in middle-class Asian countries, particularly in China, with greater increased wages and better benefits for the rural population. In conclusion, it's important to recognize the critical concept of both social and so spatial justice and inclusive grassroots policies can be applied to all countries, irrespective of their political ideology. Achieving the right to the city in the long run can be a winning, winning game for all. But in the short run, it will involve conflict with many winners and some losers. Much of the corrective measures will take time, resources, and radical policy commitments. Increasingly, concern, increasingly concerned about the quality of life, particularly by the younger generation, have trumped issues regarding the obsession of economic growth. Furthermore, spatial justice can be applied immediately even to poor countries and cities in countries like Vietnam, India, or Indonesia, and Indonesia. Policy makers will need strong political commitment and active grassroots support, as well as specific knowledge and understanding in the usage of physical urban space in order to stimulate innovation and new ideas and to contest injustices and inequality. In the process, in applying spatial justice, the quality of life can be enriched for all urban citizens and migrant workers. On this note, may I introduce Ever Suja. <laughs> Uh, first, some thanks uh, to Rita Padawangi, who has been very patient with me with uh, endless emails, uh, encouraging this invitation to come and speak about seeking spatial justice in uh, Asian cities. Uh, to Kenneth Tan about taking me around uh, today in particular, but yesterday as well, uh, and making me feel comfortable and uh, not jet lagged anymore. Uh, and uh, finally, to, to uh, William Lim for a very challenging and informative introduction on seeking spatial justice. Uh, I, I guess I have a more colorful uh, PowerPoint. Uh, I'm, as I say, very pleased to be speaking about uh, Asian cities with regard to spatial justice. Uh, I'm not going to be as deeply informative as the work of William Lim has been, very inspiring work on Singapore and other Asian cities directly on questions of justice, spatial, social, uh, and otherwise. Uh, but I will try to make some of my comments on seeking spatial justice uh, a little more relevant to some specific qualities of Asian cities. The term spatial justice is, is not, hasn't been in wide use until the last 10 or 12 years. Uh, I, I wrote that by the year 2000, there may have been two or three academic references using those specific words, spatial justice. 
And, or oh, maybe still about eight years ago, I remember entering spatial justice in my Google uh, search box, and the response was, do you mean social justice? And I wanted to write back, no, 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 I, I mean spatial justice, not social justice. Uh, but it was a very unfamiliar concept. Since the year 2000, there's been uh, a very interesting and fascinating explosion in the use of the term. Sometimes people use social and spatial justice now interchangeably. I think even William made a, a little slip early on uh, saying social justice when he meant spatial justice. And some people talk about spatial justice when they're also talking about social justice. Uh, it's a remarkable development uh, that I will try to help clarify um, what's been happening. So next slide. Starting with uh, a number of background forces that have sustained this unusual, exceptional expansion of the concept and application of the ideas of, about spatial justice. Uh, I think perhaps the broadest and most important force uh, has been what I and a few others have called the spatial turn uh, in the humanities, most of the social sciences, uh, a term, again, my, my uh, computer doesn't like it and strikes it as an unusual term, transdisciplinary, not just interdisciplinary, but a, a spatial turn that has moved across almost every discipline that exists, uh, particularly fast in the humanities, uh, intense in a few of the social sciences, not so intense in the others. Sociology is, in America has backed away to some extent. Political science in America is still to experience a deep spatial turn. Uh, but economics and, and anthropology uh, have really taken the concept very seriously and are doing some very innovative things with it. But the spatial turn, as I say, is, is really the foundation for many of my arguments about spatial justice. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, it would be much more difficult to talk about spatial justice uh, because very few were familiar with the arguments about the importance of space in a spatial perspective. Today, whether we're talking to ethnomusicologists, literary critics, archaeologists, legal scholars, they're all aware of the growing importance of a spatial perspective in their disciplines. And so when I talk about spatial justice, there's a familiar nod these days uh, that we could be talking about justice from a spatial perspective, just as we can be talking about citizenship, capital, uh, whatever uh, subject you want. Uh, and we'll get on to what this means, that this is not just uh, a kind of new fad, uh, although in some cases it's very superficial use of space. Uh, like, for example, there's a, a great popularity using the word mapping this and that, mapping the brain, mapping the state, mapping... Po very superficial, doesn't get very deep into the main subject matters. But in many areas, uh, the spatial turn is having a deep effect on the fundamental ideas in the discipline. A second factor that we need to talk about very little here, you will all understand this as well, most of this, relating to globalization, that we're seeing a kind of urbanization of the world taking place. Uh, that urbanization is not any longer confined to things we call cities, uh, but is spreading over the whole surface of the earth so that we can speak of the Amazon basin as being urban or at least urbanized to some extent. I mean, one of the features of a spatial imagination is that you recognize that every social process, every process, is unevenly developed in space. Some areas it becomes very thick, and some areas it's very thin. So what I'm saying is that urbanization is spreading over the, every inch of the Earth's surface, uh, but with varying thicknesses, we can still identify it very clearly in the Amazon, in the Sahara, in Siberia. The Antarctic ice cap is being urbanized in a significant way <clears throat> to the point where in order to study what's happening uh, in these areas, you must see it as partially due to an urbanization process. Uh, this has made such ideas as right to the city and right 
uh, urban rights and so on, uh, as a, and the urbanization of justice uh, as an important concept, sustaining this idea of spatial justice. A third factor in the background, getting a little more specific, has been the fact that the last 30 or so years has been uh, a period of intense reorganization of the global economy, of capitalism, of cities and regions and nation states around the world, a kind of crisis generated restructuring that has been happening all over the world uh, and leading to, uh, among other things, the, what I'm saying here is the kind of mass production of unjust geographies, the new economy, the new so-called flexible capitalist economy, the information-based, post-Fordist, globalized economy that uh, we're all increasingly familiar with, uh, is associated with an intensification of inequalities, that it's producing new geographies. Uh, if you, we, we talk, go back to some of the work of uh, David Harvey, he spoke about capitalism in crisis tending to turn towards a spatial fix as one of the ways it tries to resolve its crisis. Uh, and in a way, that's what's been happening, that the urban, regional, national, and international geographies, let's call them, uh, that existed in the 1960s, were entering into a period of, of instability and crisis. And what was necessary was a reorganization, not just a vertical and corporate reorganization, but a reorganization of space. And so what I've been writing about over the last 20, 30 years, uh, largely through Los Angeles, but well beyond Los Angeles, has been this process of urban restructuring, uh, spatial restructuring. And indeed, uh, I, I wrote a kind of text on this, uh, published in 2000 called Post-Metropolis, Post Critical Studies of Cities and Regions. Uh, by, which had six chapters going through various aspects of this restructuring process. Uh, and you have to remember, I'm teaching in a planning department rather than in a geography department. If you're in a social science department or a geography department, you can be politically critical and negative uh, all you want. You don't have any obligation to be relevant uh, and applied. But if you're in a planning program, the students are going to be demanding that. We don't want to hear all of this about Kristaller or Harvey or whatever, spatial justice. How can we possibly use this to change the world a little bit tomorrow? Uh, and at first you might resist that, but at times you have to give in to that kind of demand. And by the time I got to the end of uh, thinking about the last chapters of Post Metropolis, I had realized that I had painted a very dark picture of the contemporary metropolis, uh, that it was deeply unequal. It had all kinds of surveillance and, and, and military forces shaping it, walls and fences and imprisonment and carceral cities and cities of courts and uh, crime and guns. And you know, it was a really dark picture. Uh, and my, my more Marxist uh, thoughts uh, painted it as almost inevitable and unchangeable until I realized I couldn't do this to my students. Uh, I did this once when I first started and they said, you're brilliant, this is wonderful, I'm leaving planning. Uh, <laughs> this is the, I'm, you, after all, you just told me I'm the right arm of the bourgeoisie. Why should I stay in this bloody planning program that does nothing? Uh, so I realized I had to do something and I started wondering what can I do? Was there anything positive happening around me? And that's when I started looking a little bit about what was happening in the immediate environment I was in. Uh, and I began to see some interesting new kinds of struggles emerging that had a, a strong spatial consciousness to them uh, and were successful in achieving at least a little bit more justice than had existed prior to them. Uh, and so I began a very different kind of uh, process that eventually led to the book uh, of Seeking Spatial Justice, 10 years later. Okay, another force uh, is a shift from metropolitan to regional organization, regional urbanization. I won't have the time to get into this, but this is a major argument that I'm working on today, and maybe the subject of the next book I write, if I 
survive the present one I'm writing. Um, and that has the idea that we all have a kind of metropolitan urban model in our mind. Big central city where urban life is very dense and exciting and thrilling and, and has museums and uh, uh, galleries and drugs and, and, and crime and violence. And, but it's exciting and it's the urban. It's urbanism as a way of life. And it's surrounded by suburban rings, boring, dull, homogeneous, nothing much happening, but very pretty and green and healthy. Uh, and, and just the suburbs are growing more rapidly than the central. You know, the kind of thing that we all think about uh, in what I call a metropolitan model. And what I'm saying is that there's a new model, a new dynamic of urbanization that people are recognizing in pieces, like things like the, the edge city idea or the you know, weird thing, Boombergs, polycentric network city regions, uh, that what's happening is uh, this old model, the old metropolitan model is slowly falling apart, disappearing, and a new dynamic is taking its place. A dynamic that's leading to such unusual paradoxical things like the urbanization of suburbia, the densification of suburbia as part of what I'm calling is a regional urbanization process, and a new regionalism is emerging. And this new regionalism is feeding into the seeking spatial justice ideas, the right to the city ideas, making it at least the right to the city region, uh, and adding to the right to the city some notion of regional democracy, regional governance, regional spatial justice as well. And then finally, which is a big one I want to spend a little more time with, uh, all of these factors are associated with what I'm calling a new kind of spatial consciousness, a new way of thinking about space that is not the same as the way most of us probably in this room continue to think about space. Uh, when I outline it next, in the next slide, uh, this will probably be familiar to you, but nevertheless, we still think about space in terms of physical form. Now, I'm not saying space does not have a physical form. I'm saying space is physical form, but much more than just physical form. And that if we see space only in this physical quality, as background, environment, container, stage, or whatever, uh, a kind of background built environment, a kind of external geography, we're going to miss all of the key arguments about seeking spatial justice. Uh, the spatial consciousness that I think is necessary and is beginning to emerge from the spatial turn, the regional, new regionalism, and a number of other uh, background developments, is one that begins with a very Lefebvrean kind of idea, which is radical 40 years ago. Today, it seems so obvious that the space or the spatiality we speak about is socially produced. In other words, we make our geographies. Now, we is a very big we, collectively. The more powerful in society have a much greater emphasis on shaping these geographies. But these geographies are not naturally given or God-given or whatever. They're not just out there and we react to them. We make them. We shape them. We construct them. Uh, and this is the first step that we're talking about these socialized geographies, geographies that have social objectives and ideas and structures built into them, uh, because this, these are the producers of the geographies we live in. Uh, this is uh, the first step. The second step is a little more complicated, uh, and it's to recognize uh, that maybe from birth we are spatial beings and that we are always engaged in a two-way process. Uh, it's useful to think of this in, in, in terms of the baby and the body uh, because it comes across better than on this larger scale of the urban and the societal. But that is, from birth we're involved in shaping, trying as best we can to shape our environments to suit our needs. All right? At the same time, however, 
Our environment is shaping our behavior in very significant ways. And it's a two-way street. It's not just the shaping of urban form or spatial form, but the fact that spatial form reacts back. I called this a long time ago uh, the socio-spatial dialectic. It's a fancy term. It's actually quite straightforward if you uh, uh, follow it, because most people say, oh, yeah, I believe in Soja's socio-spatial dialectic. But in practice, they only look at social processes shaping spatial form. What makes geographies? Capitalism makes geographies. Feminism shapes the geography of the city. Race and racism shapes uh, the spatial relations in, in, in urban contexts. But very rarely th is there research in the reaction back, in part because many geographers felt that they were burnt in their attempts at geographical determinism in the 19th century. They're, they're afraid to talk about geographical influences on social class, on race, on gender uh, relations. But the socio-spatial dialectic is arguing that each flow is, is equal in importance. We need to do both of them together because the interaction between them is, is what development and societal development and change is all about, how the social and the spatial interact. So technically, I guess, uh, rather than talking about spatial justice is not an alternative to social justice, we should be talking about socio-spatial justice. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's both simultaneously, interactively, and, and that's an interesting way of looking at it rather than trying to separate too much the social from the spatial. Okay, so, so we must believe spaces are socially produced and that the social and the spatial interact in complex and important ways. And thirdly, it is more Foucauldian than from Lefebvre, and that is the argument that the geographies we make can be oppressive, can have negative consequences on our lives. This is uh, you know, not an easy thing to understand uh, to some degree, but in many ways it's, it's sort of obvious that the geography of the city shows that some places, some areas, uh, are poorer, have uh, worse environments with regard to health uh, and so on, that there are unjust distributions. There are places that have no access to good food or to health services or to educational services of an equal level, that, that these geographies can have negative consequences. Uh, a lot of feminists have argued that, for example, the geography of the city uh, has been built under masculinist principles, and therefore makes the city life, urban life, much more uncomfortable for women. Uh, cities are also raced, in a sense, that race becomes embedded in the urban environment uh, in very complicated ways that sometimes shape, shape back and maintain segregation, maintain inequality, maintain injustices. So if we're not looking at how the geographies we produce shape our lives back, we're never going to really understand the concept of spatial justice. So we need that kind of argument as well. Another reason for having that argument is a very practical and political one that goes back a little bit to what I was saying about planning versus social theory more abstractly. Uh, and that is, if we see the geographies we produce, the bad geographies that we produce, as produced by us, that means that they are changeable. That if we produce bad geographies, we can also collectively act to change those geographies for the better. Uh, and this becomes a central part of how some of the spatial theory and broad spatial thinking that's been going on is being translated into political action and social practice. Uh, the idea is that we uh, recognize that we produced some uh, geographies that advantage some and disadvantage others, that have some oppressive consequences, and that we need to organize and act to change them for the better. This is a foundational concept of what I think of as seeking spatial justice. The last point I have is another feature of uh, what happens when we... <clears throat> 
try to spatialize our practice, to, to engage in a kind of transformation of bad geographies, if I can really radically simplify what I'm saying. Uh, and that has to do with uh, the fact that, that it's, it's easier for different kinds of groups to share an understanding of this negative consequence of space than it is of sh uh, other foundations for sharing. Most social movements in the past, urban social movements if you want as well, uh, were very channeled. Each one thinking of itself as being historically constructed, and what we wanted to do was to change the history of oppression by freeing us and making us more equal to transform subaltern hegemon relationships into some greater equality. Uh, this still reinforced the channels, whether one is a feminist or a labor organizer and a labor struggle. Uh, or an anti-racist uh, uh, working towards uh, uh, struggling against racism, that frequently it was, let us achieve our goals first, and then the rest will follow. You know, let us uh, succeed in, in, in the labor struggle, and then we can deal with gender and, and race and other issues. Uh, what this also meant was that it's very difficult for social movements to co cross-combine, because there was a tendency to essentialize your own movement particularly when you saw it in historical terms. What I'm saying is that seeing their oppressions in spatial terms provides at least one new mode of connecting up different social movements. Coalition building is a very powerful part of what I see as searching for spatial justice. The idea of cutting across different forms and modes of justice and injustice, to organize on a larger scale with a coalition of organizations, a coalition of social movements and alliances, uh, which are necessary to succeed in any struggle over spatial justice. OK, next. This is another one of my arguments that I've been making for zillions of years. Uh, and I, I repeated after the spatial turn why, again, another reason for turning to a spatial perspective. Uh, these are my optimistic statements. You don't have to believe me, but this is what drives me, if I can describe it that way. That the idea is that whatever your interests may be, they can benefit from the application of a critical spatial perspective. In part, this relates to another argument I've been making, that historical thinking has tended to drown spatial thinking over the past 150 years in particularly Western thought, not so much in Eastern thought. And that's one of the more interesting things I'm finding out uh, about how Eastern cultures, uh, Asian cultures in particular, uh, are more comfortable, perhaps, with thinking about space uh, than Western and, and North American kinds of cultures. Uh, but uh, again, whatever the subject, any subject, uh, and again, the next one, spatial thinking can not only enrich the understanding of almost any other subject, but has the potential for opening up radically new insights that weren't there before, particularly with regard to practice, to action to doing something about the conditions of the world. Uh, and this is a, a further reason for insisting on that spatial there. And indeed, not just including a spatial dimension, but putting spatial first. As I said, before the year 2000, one academic article, one architectural pamphlet, and one doctoral dissertation and that's it for ever using the word spatial justice. If you read spatial articles about spatial justice today, very much often, uh, very often you find David Harvey, and particularly his book, Social Justice in the City, as the original thinker or user of the term spatial justice. I've got a secret. Spatial, uh, David Harvey has never used the word spatial justice. 
Uh, the idea of putting the spatial in front of justice, even studying justice as a Marxist geographer is uncomfortable. And so he abandoned his earlier work on justice uh, early on, after, after 73, when Social Justice of the City was produced, uh, was published. But uh, the, 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 the basic idea uh, of putting space first seems to be making the spatial more powerful creative, causal, and so on. And so he's hesitated from that and started out with a little more innocent notion of territorial justice. Although, if you read it, he's talking about spatial justice. I agree. But I think it's significant that he personally is uncomfortable and continues to be so today, even in his return to Lefebvre, which is very recent, uh, with the concept of using the concept of spatial justice. And after his initial commentary, he, he doesn't talk about it very often at all in his work. Uh, okay, next. What is spatial justice? Of course, I'm asked, and I always refuse to give any kind of cookbook answer. There's no simple answer of that. Uh, what I want to talk about is defining spatial justice in multiple ways, multiple interacting layers of definitions, because there are many aspects uh, to the concept of spatial justice uh, that don't really fit uh, any simple definition, sort of the spatial aspects of justice, but that's still too vague. How do we get more specific in order to identify the particular forms of action we might need here in Singapore or in Asian cities or in cities anywhere to achieve spatial justice. Um, one thing we know is that we can approach spatial justice as a theory, as a model or mode for empirical analysis, uh, and as a strategy for social action. Uh, I've tended to deal with all three in seeking spatial justice, uh, and uh, I'll try to actually keep the three going together without emphasizing the theoretical too much, uh, but talk about some empirical aspects uh, of studying cities that might enhance the struggle for spatial justice. So, okay, let's go ahead and try to define the various dimensions of spatial justice next, starting with struggles over geography. That shouldn't, you know, invoke a kind of discomfort, strange response. But uh, 10 or 15 years ago, there were struggles over geography. What could that mean? Like uh, the European spatial development perspective. What could that be? Spatial development, what's that? Uh, but same thing with struggles of geography. And I, and I, and I use uh, the words of Edward Said, uh, the famous post-colonial scholar, uh, who had as rich a spatial imagination as anyone uh, I know, uh, and was particularly interested in the spatial injustices associated with the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories, uh, arguing how in great detail this process was uh, an unjust process and an unjust occupation in multiple ways uh, in terms of uh, dominating spaces of every kind from the railway station to the school to the to the public space in the plaza uh, that that there was a kind of inculcation of injustice into micro spaces as well and so he said uh, just as none of us are beyond geography none of us are completely free from the struggles over geography when I talked about spatial beings and the baby and the infant, uh, the infant is clearly already captured in a geography and in making a geography and being made by that geography. Uh, but he's saying that, that uh, these sometimes should be seen as struggles over geography. Uh, and as I say, maybe, I don't want to get, I'm, I'm infatuated with my granddaughter at the moment, so I keep talking about fascinating infants uh, and young beings doing some wonderful things. Uh, but uh, we can talk about everything else, for, including contemporary Middle Eastern relations. 
uh, as struggles over geography. And he said, the struggles are, are complex and interesting, more interesting than ever before, because he starts talking about a spatial turn next, saying that things are, are becoming more interesting in this studying of an understanding of struggles over geography, uh, because it is not only about soldiers and cannons. Now, why would he mention that? Well, because geography, in a famous French uh, book uh, interview from a Marxist French geographer called Yves Lacoste, Geography, ça sert d'abord de faire la guerre. Geography, its first purpose is to make war. Uh, this has been the practice of geography in a heavy state sense for many, many centuries. Uh, and so hence the association of geography with cannons and soldiers. But he's saying now it goes way beyond that uh, into ideas uh, about forms, about images and imaginings, uh, a much more creative and involved and complicated uh, notion of space and spatiality. Uh, okay, next. Uh, this is a bit of an aside, and it's important to recognize that when you're thinking spatially, and this is in very important in the spatial turn because it's one of the consequences that has been written about a lot by geographers, but non-geographers have, have, have great difficulty with this concept of scale. Uh, and so I just wanted to very briefly and very simply uh, recognize that when we're talking about spatial justice, it can be applied at many different scales. We live in a, a multiple scales, from the body to the planet. And there are multiple regional scales above the body that shape our lives and that we shape, and that we produce unjust geographies in. Uh, and as I say, it can be a revolve around the body, the household, the immediate neighborhood, the city, and its uneven development where much of the research is done on differences from different parts of the city. Uh, but we, as I say, we can do that with differences in different parts of the household. Some parts are dominated by some members of the household versus other parts. It may not be earth-shaking spatial injustices, but nevertheless sometimes very powerful ones. Uh, and then to the scale that I always uh, feel myself most comfortably drawn to and working on, and that's the regional scale. Some of the most interesting literature on and ideas about uneven development have come from the regional econ economics and regional political economy literature uh, on uneven development. Uh, and I'm always interested in regional inequalities and the efforts to reduce spatial inequalities and regional inequalities as another form of injustice. And then, of course, the global, the international division of labor, the former division in first, second, and third worlds, the north versus south, the developed versus developing. These are spatial phenomena, and they recognize dominant versus subordinated regions. Their, their inherent structure is uneven and unjust. And so we can talk about spatial injustice at a global scale as well, at a planetary scale. And the same thing. There's now a new thing called planetary urban. Rather than global urbanization, people are now talking about planetary urbanization. Why? Because I think they want to include, and as it should be, include questions of climate change and environmental issues uh, in this globalization studies and ur global urbanization studies as well. Uh, and so uh, struggling at an, multiple scales uh, is, is very important. Uh, and, and, and indeed, each of these scales interrelates to the others. Uh, but we must be very careful that this doesn't confuse us and, and force us into paralysis when we realize, oh my God, do we struggle at this scale or that scale? What it does is makes you suspicious of the simplicity of that cliche, think global, act local. I mean, think global, think regional, think national, think urban, Drink neighborhood, you know, and act at all of these scales. Uh, that that there's not just a local and global scale, but there are multiple scales in between that we need to recognize. So that's just this aside on scale, which is important when we think about 
struggles over geography at multiple scales. Next. OK. Another definition of, territory, uh, of spatial justice comes from David Harvey's adaptation of an original concept by a, a Welsh social policy analysis in the School of Public Policy, Bledon Davis, who's an old, old fellow who's still around, and I think he's still around at LSE in social policy. And he started writing about what he called, he was the first to use the term territorial, he didn't use it spatial justice. He called it territorial justice. He was a planner and public policy figure. And what he was involved in in, Great, in Britain was the allocation of resources to various territorial units, public resources. And he's saying we should not apply or give public, or allocate public resources based upon pure population size, but based on, instead, an assessment of need that is, allocation of resources should be rooted in needs of the population we're talking about, like housing for the immigrant population of Singapore, uh, or the allocation of housing resources in, in a place like Singapore or anywhere else, uh, that it must be based and assessed on the actual needs of different groups of the population. Uh, well, let's go to the next, next uh, uh, and I'll illustrate a little further, with the illustration of uh, uh, a group and, and an experience that is central to my writings on spatial justice. And that is the extraordinary uh, developments around a group called the Bus Riders Union uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, and this is illustrating as powerfully I, as I can both the concept of seeking spatial justice and this notion of territorial justice as part of spatial justice, the allocation of public resources based upon need. Uh, what the Bus Riders Union was, was a, a sponsored by a very interesting radical community labor group called the Strategy Center, Labor Community Strategy Center in Los Angeles, very important and interesting group, uh, who organized what were called the transit-dependent population of Los Angeles, uh, the transit-dependent working poor of Los Angeles, which some estimates said was 40% of the population. That is a population that has multiple jobs and not based on welfare, uh, but even with these multiple jobs can survive very much higher than the poverty level. So the term working poor started in Los Angeles, actually. Uh, and this transit-dependent population was a population that couldn't afford to run a car. Uh, it was too expensive to run a car. So therefore, the biggest public transit system available, the freeway system in Los Angeles, freeway meaning they didn't have to pay tolls, but they'd have to run a car, uh, was unavailable to them. And so therefore, the journey to work, to school, to shopping, to entertainment, required public transit. All right? So this group, the Bus Riders Union, sued in court the Metropolitan Transit Authority, which at the time was involved in building a subway system, uh, a metro system, uh, saying, well, Los Angeles is one of the great global cities in it's huge, one of the biggest cities without a metro system. We need a metro system to be a true global nonsense, right? But they were spending billions and billions of dollars building a freeway system, and the stupid people decided to increase the fare of buses. And what this meant was this transit-dependent population was being forgotten. Uh, and they argued that this was a form of discrimination based upon their needs. The Metropolitan Transit Authority came out with all kinds of statistics to show that the poor are getting about this, you know, a little bit more attention than the rich uh, in terms of transit needs, but uh, nowhere near the needs being met 
of this transit-dependent population. So they sued the Metropolitan Transit Authority and won a consent decree which forced the MTA to put bus system development as their first priority and to push fixed rail investment out of the picture, almost, because they had nothing left after being forced to buy environment-friendly buses, spend money to change uh, routing uh, uh, procedures, to reduce bus crime, redesign, bu you know, all kinds of things happening uh, from that uh, argument. Now, this was, to me, an unprecedented event that a public policy that involved billions of dollars that would have almost surely benefited the wealthy more than the poor. Would it benefit the poor? Yeah. But as usual, almost every public policy in an industrial capitalist city benefits the wealthy more than the poor. Uh, and in fact, many people took David Harvey's statement around those lines uh, as gospel, that yeah, this is true all the time. Now, you can't have planning or any public policy. The normal workings, David Harvey argued, of the urban system leads to a redistribution of income from the poor to the wealthy, and that this is what's going to happen all the time. That, that's what I told those students way back then when they said they're quitting planning, uh, was among the other things I was saying. But here was an example of a, a huge project involving billions of dollars that shifted from one benefiting the rich more than the poor to one benefiting the poor more than the rich. A very counter-radical kind of uh, result. And boy, was it potentially revolutionary. Uh, because what did it mean? And this is very important, I think, for thinking about spatial justice in Asian cities and else all over the world. Uh, what did it mean? It meant that every public plan, no matter what it is for, for housing, for transit, for education, for health, public health, could be susceptible or needed to be susceptible to a justice test. In other words, you can take the plan, do a good empirical, maybe even GIS analysis, to show whether this plan is going to have negative effects with regard to the needs of the poorest and most disadvantaged population. And if this was shown to be the case, throw the plans out. I mean, this was virtually saying almost every plan done by any city anywhere in the US would be subject to legal constraints. Uh, and so, uh, it, it was so radical in its potential implications that if it weren't for the Iraq war, it would have been stopped immediately. But it, they waited a couple of years until 2001, and a fixed case was brought up to the US Supreme Court, which by that time had become a conservative majority, five to four. And sure enough, in a case called Alexander versus Sandoval, the US Supreme Court, as it did with the civil rights movement, uh, said, Discriminatory practices, you have to prove intent. You have to prove that the planners said, let's get those poor people, and let's give as much money as we can to the rich and wealthy. Now, that's not going to happen in any court of law very often, eh? uh, even if it's true, but it doesn't matter. Uh, you can't prove intent. But even worse, Scalia, the, the leader of this, this disgusting conservative majority, and the US Supreme Court that destroyed one of the most democratic institutions in US history, uh, came out and, and also said, na, na, na. <laughs> uh, it was terrible. He said, I, we will, I think we should forbid all private organizations from suing any government authority on discriminatory practices. I couldn't believe that. And, and, but yet, it, it, it happened without protest. There's the beginnings of a protest from radical lawyers and other liberal lawyers today. Uh, but uh, this case was closing off this precedent that was opened up by the Bus Riders Union, that all public policies could be subject to discriminatory practices arguments. Uh, and so this notion of territorial justice, which is, I think, in the previous slide, 
uh, I noted that was, uh, came initially from David Harvey's Social Justice in the City, is an important part uh, of uh, the concept of spatial justice. Uh, I would prefer putting spatial first rather than territorial because territorial is a bit waffly. Uh, and spatial has this more powerful emergent meaning. Uh, but nevertheless, I don't want to negate the importance of this concept uh, because based on this, what we're saying is that uh, spatial justice involves allocation of resources based on need, recognizing need, and particularly looking at uh, poor and disadvantaged populations as deserving not just equal attention to others, uh, but special attention to their needs, if their needs are more urgent. By the way, this also related to the urban restructuring arguments because the working poor in the United States, or in Los Angeles in particular, had multi-locational jobs. That is, they, they worked Monday in this house as a domestic and Wednesday in this house and so on, or a gardener. Uh, and so they needed to, to uh, have a, a transit network, a public transit system, uh, that was adaptive to these very complicated weekly, daily, locational needs. Uh, a, a fixed rail system like spokes in a wheel wasn't going to do this. So it basically said the spatial structure of the network being produced or being recommended for the fixed rail system, the railway system, was spatially unjust. Its spatial organization, its spatial structure, was unjust in itself for the needs of that population. It would have been hard to make it as a generic, philosophical, theoretical point that this transit system is unjust. But if you start adding some of the specificities of the urban, you can begin to get a stronger argument, which is why the Bus Riders Union, I begin seeking spatial justice with an analysis of this case, because it illustrates the concept of spatial justice. And there are many other ways. The, the, the co-leader of the organization, the Strategy Center, has a PhD in radical architectural theory. Uh, they're, they're very spatial in their uh, concept. They use GIS in the court case and all kinds of maps to show these injustices. Uh, and so it's a kind of rich example uh, of spatial injustice. Similar court cases were made in other cities in the United States, in Cleveland and Philadelphia, I think, and they lost in the courts because they just made a kind of civil rights discriminatory, racial discriminatory case. And that wasn't sufficient. The big difference in the Los Angeles case was that they added a spatial dimension. Without using the word spatial injustice, the spatial geographical dimension was there in the case that one in, in this unprecedented example. OK, next. Um, again, I've, I've uh, continued the bus riders example and raised the issue of uh, how this might be relevant to Asian cities. I just don't know uh, the answers. But to raise the question, can the legal system in a place like Singapore be used to seek spatial justice for the poor based upon their specific and special needs. Uh, I, I, the legal system in various places has various degrees of openness to these possibilities. Uh, but certainly, I'm wondering, uh, in Asian cities, how far that kind of bus riders union example for public resource allocation uh, can go. Secondly, and how can we develop measures for a spatial justice test of public policy? My book doesn't do this at all. It's a very really weak point in the, in the book. But it's really one of the important future challenges for spatial justice work. That is, how do we uh, do a spatial justice test of public policies? You're in this policy school. Uh, you should all be trying to work on some of this issue, uh, on these issues. How do we take a plan for housing or for public transit or for uh, health facilities and public health and test it for its levels of justice, uh, particularly its spatial justice levels. A big challenge. I, I, I don't have answers. I have a couple of ideas, but no answers. And I challenge you all 
uh, to engage in this. Uh, and even more so, how do we make the process of public resource allocation more spatially just? This is what David Harvey did to uh, simple arguments about justice from Rawls and others. He made the argument that we need to move just from outcomes, the spatially unjust outcomes of these processes, to the process itself. So he spoke about territorial justice justly arrived at. And I think this is still an interesting principle uh, in spatial justice uh, that we need to make not only for more just outcomes, but for more just processes leading to these outcomes, which I think is a bigger challenge and more difficult challenge, but nevertheless one that has to be, uh, one has to be aware of. Next. Okay. When I talk about spatial justice, I used to say it's not a territorial justice, it's not environmental justice, it's not this. But now I'm, I'm saying it is, it, and incorporates these concepts and tries to go beyond them. So I would argue today that environmental justice is a very, very valuable component, in particular because the environmental justice mov movement, politically and through the courts, had a very important impact. And that had to do with making locational or geographical discrimination on a par with racial and gender and other religious forms of discrimination as something that is subject to civil rights action, court action. Uh, when you find that where you live shapes to a very significant extent your lifespan, infant mortality rates, your income, your health, uh, that certain parts of the city are going to get greater negative effects from environmental water uh, pollution, uh, access to potable water, uh, and other kinds of uh, features that I think I talk about here and next. Well, uh, having to do with things like the location of toxic waste, uh, uh, disposal dumps, incinerators, where they're put. Uh, this has been the subject of environmental justice, but it really, in this locational discrimination, is a variant of the problem of spatial injustice that has to do with, well, not always, but things that are associated with the physical environment. Uh, but sometimes it's not the physical environment at all. Uh, but nevertheless, environmental justice was very important because even to this day, it's still easier to understand environmental justice than it is spatial justice, which is a pity, and I think will change in the future. But uh, this was an important part, so that prior to 2000, both territorial justice and, and environmental justice in particular were used, and I see them as keeping alive the idea of spatial justice into the 21st century, where now the concept of spatial justice is broadening and inclusive, becoming more inclusive of these other kinds of approaches to justice. Okay, next. Uh, one of the problems with this, as with territorial justice, is that sticking environment first sometimes lead people to think of as, as they think about what is causing the injustice, uh, many environmentalists start drifting over to Mother Nature doing it. Mother Nature getting even by creating floods and famine. That there's environmental causality here. When there's a political spatial causality that's going on, that often gets neglected. And so there's a need, I see, for consciously spatializing the environmental justice concept and movement to incorporate some of the environmental issues that they deal with into the search for spatial justice. Again, uh, as I said, environmental justice with regard to Asian cities may still be more understandable than spatial justice, but I hope that's changing, particularly with the work of people like William Lim and others. Uh, but there's serious problems, special problems of water pollution, uh, disease, infant mortality, flood control, preparation for going to Jakarta, uneven lifespan that I think if we express them in spatial terms with some maps and some good GIS, 
you increase the, I'm not saying you automatically are going to be successful, but you increase the likelihood, I think, of these issues being addressed than if you flatly looked at them in just straightforward social and political terms. That the spatial is still, and maybe for a while will continue to be a little more innocent in its, the way it sounds. Uh, and so I think the same with environmental justice as well. Okay, next. Uh, I don't want to leave this out because it's another interesting dimension of uh, spatial justice. It has to do with unjust boundary making. Uh, the first reference to spatial injustice had to do with electoral districts in the United States being racially unjust. The way in which districts were gerrymandered uh, initially had to do with race. Today, the Supreme Court has, uh, has forbidden gerrymandering based on race, but allowed it with regard to political party. So the last election, uh, the Democratic Party won more votes in state legislatures around the country, but Congress increased its Republican, well, the Republican majority remained the same, in part because the, the, the Republicans had won the 2010 by-election, in a sense, and 2010 was the census year and the year for redistricting. And so the state legislatures, which were then dominated by Republicans, were able to redistrict freely to redistrict things to make them twist like to force Republican incumbents to be more likely to be voted in, no matter what the overall vote was. So there's all kinds of problems with these districting boundaries. And I was talking to some Chinese scholars, by the way, seeking spatial justice, I hope in, in a month or two will be out in a Chinese translation. Uh, and there are a number of scholars doing work on spatial justice uh, in China today. And when I talked to one, one current, current student uh, about, you know, what are the kinds of spatial injustices that you see existing in big Chinese cities, and he said one of them, of course, has to do with access to public services by populations who have migrated from areas that, that have been defined as rural in other words, if you come from an area defined as rural, even if it's so urban that it's on the verge of being declared urban, but if you come from it and live in the city, you don't have urban rights. Uh, and so that boundary is of crucial importance. By the way, these rural areas uh, translating in, into urban areas uh, have a, a special word of peri-urbanization, have a special term extended region, uh, urban regions, city regions uh, in China, and they're expected to absorb 200 million people in the next several decades in China. Uh, and maybe that will resolve some of the problems. But right now, there are millions of people living in cities who, because they came from areas described as rural, considered rural, don't have urban rights. Uh, and this seems to be a uh, an important focus for spatial justice struggles uh, in Chinese cities. Next, but it illustrates uh, this larger issue of unfair and unjust boundaries. Food justice is another specialized large areas that ha have no access to fresh fruit and vegetables and so on. Uh, and that this is leading to dependence on fast food places and on obesity increases and so on and so forth and also with other forms of malnourishment. Uh, and this is giving rise to some interesting new emphases on urban agriculture. I don't know what's happening in Singapore now, but uh, uh, there's a lot of new attention being given to agriculture and farming and community gardens within cities. And now in another area that I work on with Jane Jacobs and Chatelhuyuk and the original cities, Jane Jacobs argues that farming was originally an urban occupation. And now after 12,000 years or 10,000 years, it's returning to be an urban occupation, farming. An interesting twist. Okay, next. And here's the, the, the summa summative concept. The right to the city, as, as uh, 
Uh, William Lim noted it's a Lefebvrean concept developed in the late 60s, applied very much in the uprising in Paris in May of 1968. Uh, but his original idea was uh, that this right to the city was to get the mass of the population to participate more deeply in the social construction of urban space. Uh, that the spaces of the city were being produced for the mass, for the public, for the workers, for the students, by powerful authorities in the market and the state. Uh, and he was arguing that everyone, every resident, he didn't use citizen, he used uh, citadin, the resident person in the city. Uh, that if you resided in the city, you, were, uh, you should be able to have the rights to the resources that urban life provides. It's a, it's a simple idea, but it's, it's a concept that uh, can appeal to collective democratic ideologies uh, and works to sort of uh, stimulate a movement towards spatial justice. Uh, as I say, uh, this is a, a, a kind of concretization and spatialization of arguments about basic human rights. Um, he he, he now always used the word, uh, or the translation has always been a singular right to the city, uh, but it obviously takes multiple form. Uh, and uh, as I said, he, he, initially he was talking about Paris, right? that's Lefebvre anyway. Uh, but he was broadly talking, I think, if you really look at the idea as the right to inhabit space anyway. He wasn't talking about just the boundaries of what is a city, but he was talking about everyone's right to live where they want to live and to gain the benefits that come from that location. Now, if you don't have a geographical imagination, this doesn't, you know, if you think the economy and the polity exist on the head of a pin with no spatial dimensions, then this doesn't make sense. What do you mean, the advantages of living at a particular location in a city or a region or wherever, what benefits? Well, now, uh, I'm skipping over a great deal, the most innovative work in geographical economics has to do with agglomeration economies, with what are called Jane Jacobs externalities in the textbooks now, wild. Uh, and that has to do with recognizing that cities give off a generative force that is the primary force behind all economic development, technological change, and cultural creativity. Uh, so, I mean, urban life is a generative force for practically everything. And what the right to the city now getting new enforced interest uh, is because what resources everyone needs to share in have become even more enormous than they were in the past. Next slide. There's now a, a, a global movement about the right to the city. There's a global charter on the right to the city, which is pretty soft and fuzzy, but nevertheless significant on its just existence. Uh, there's a new national movement in the United States called the Right to the City Alliance, founded in Los Angeles, despite what David Harvey says in the introduction to rebel cities. It wasn't founded in Atlanta. It's founded in Los Angeles, but that doesn't matter. Uh, and now it consists of regional organizations, and that's significant all around the country. Regional organizations in New York and Washington and Miami and Chicago and Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, and uh, raising questions about can Asian megacity regions lead the way in this right to the city movement? Uh, a very interesting and important question uh, that maybe Asian cities have as I was saying early on, perhaps some advantage in this struggle over spatial justice, in the ability to become aware of spatial injustices. And maybe we're going to see some of the most interesting new ideas coming out from uh, Asian cities and uh, the Asian megacities. I even ask, as a regionalist uh, that I am, whether these regional trading blocks like ASEAN can pick up on some of these progressive ideas in the future. This is very optimistic, folks. I'm not saying I think this is going to happen. Uh, but I'm saying we shouldn't neglect the small possibility 
that these large regional blocks that are being formed all over the world can do something more than just guaranteeing free trade and free enterprise, but actually engage in some elements that lead to increasing spatial justice. A question. Next, yeah. So just summarizing, justice and injustice are infused into the multi-scale geographies and built environments in which we live, from the intimacies of the household and the body to the uneven development of the global economy. These socialized geographies of injustice significantly affect our lives, creating, a, this is a very important concept, lasting structures of unevenly distributed advantage and disadvantage. This is another form of empirical investigation. What are the structures which create spatial advantage and disadvantage in Singapore or in any kind of city? What are the forces that are creating the most unjust cities, un spatially unjust circumstances? Uh, and we must act collectively, building alliances and coalitions to make our geographies more just at these multiple scales. That more than ever before, it requires coalitions. Individual organizations, whether they're community organizations, labor organizations, justice organizations, NGOs, alone are not going to be successful. The opposition is much too strong, as you're aware of here in Singapore all the time. Uh, and so the only way it's going to happen is if larger and larger scale coalitions are formed, joining groups of very different types. And this means strange bedfellows, as they say. Uh, that sometimes maybe groups of yuppies, oh my God, you know, how could you get them involved? Uh, you know, that, that there might be some uh, odd combinations of people that might work in some of these environments, uh, uh, in some of these organizations and coalitions uh, that, that you have to be open to. The idea is to sort of construct as large and as diverse and as flexible and as powerful a, a coalition as you can. Uh, inviting labor groups, religious groups, ethnic organizations, all kinds of organizations to join together. Even if they're so very diverse, they're going to be better able to share the concept of spatial justice than many other concepts. They'll all understand what spatial injustice with regard to their struggles mean. And so therefore, the idea of coalition building uh, is enhanced by the search for spatial justice in the concept. OK, uh, spatial justice. Now, both the spatial and the concept of justice have obtained a new uh, significance and meaning, particularly in encouraging these cross-cutting kinds of linkages between very different kinds of organizations. Uh, and uh, as I said you know, before, economic restructuring, neoliberal globalization, and unregulated flexible capitalism have produced unprecedented levels of inequality and social polarization. Last time I was here in, 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 in Singapore, uh, people were trying to impress me about egal how egalitarian Singapore was. Uh, now Willie, Willie Lim has convinced me that uh, all the indications are suggesting that Singapore is about unequal uh, as almost any other society except the, the US. And in the US, I know the levels of inequality and polarization between the 1% and the 99% are greater than at any other times in US history, greater than the times of the Great Depression, greater than in the robber barons of the 19th century. And as someone started to argue against me, what about slavery? Weren't they more unequal then? I'm not even sure about that. Uh, that I think if we got good statistics, uh, uh, we could have you know, done things that to show that not quite the inequality that exists today with the upper 1%, I don't know how many, what you say, 30, maybe 50, 80% higher than the, the lower equivalents, uh, and massive accumulation of wealth in the top 1%. Uh, focusing on spatial plus justice helps in unifying these diverse constituencies and promoting new forms of coalition. I'm going to uh, end very quickly now with just a quick run through Los Angeles, just some pictures. Uh, learning from Los Angeles, go next. You can read this quickly. Uh, the main point I'm making is that the Los Angeles success stories that I mentioned really revolve around this new spatial consciousness uh, and awareness, and that 
Without it, I don't think these organizations would have been as successful. One of them being the Bus Riders Union. Next. And next. All right, distinguishing these movements with their spatial consciousness. And the last point here, next. Uh, this is very important here. Uh, and that is, I make an argument that there was a very special link between these organizations in the community out there and the urban planning particular and somewhat geography departments at the university. Uh, in some of these organizations, we had 30, 40, 50 of our students involved over the years creating a, a really two-way flow between the department uh, and the community. And I uh, asked the question, uh, after the glory days of this period, which are not as glorious today as they once were, uh, but can a universe, university departments uh, in Singapore of public policy, of planning and geography, contribute to this kind of interaction with the community? Uh, in ways that have encouraged things so much in Los Angeles. Next, some visuals. <laughs> I usually don't have visuals, but a few visuals. This is the Bus Riders Union. Next. I have this to show the Bus Riders Union was very consciously multilingual. The Korean population in Los Angeles has been very active in everything going on. And so you see a, a demonstration in Koreatown behind this Koreatown, Korean language lettering. And on the banner, for the Bus Riders Union is the Bus Riders Union in Korean. Next, this is the other organization I mentioned, the, the uh, Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy. Uh, they have led the struggles against Walmart and developed these community benefit agreements, a wonderful new concept that's spreading around the US. That is, new developments shouldn't be stopped. It's not stop development. It's saying new developments must negotiate with local coalitions to give social benefits to these populations for the right to build something. Developers have to negotiate, specifically the law says, with local coalitions for social benefit investments in worker centers, in healthcare, in design, and uh, public art, and educational programs, and Whatever, you negotiate with the developer for these public uh, communication, community benefits agreements. are really one of the few positive ideas in planning coming out in the United States. Next. And this is the last group, the Rights of the City Alliance, uh, which, as they say, is now spreading across the country in rapid ways. Next. And that's my final uh, slide. And it's the one that's coming from the Right to the City. Uh, arguing about taking back the city. Thank you. I think it's, it's, it's always very difficult to have to make even a short comment on such an eloquent and uh, thought-provoking uh, intellectual tour de force, uh, for which I think we all are grateful. What I'd like to do is basically just touch on two points in Professor Soja's thinking uh, which personally for me I have found very useful in developing my own thinking on cities and urbanization in, in Southeast Asia. The first point, the first concept that I find particularly useful, uh, particularly also perhaps it is because I'm a sociologist, is the, this concept uh, which he highlights of socio-spatial dialectic. Um, the key insight being that the spatial shapes the social just as much as the social shapes the spatial. And I think that's a dimension uh, which is embedded in a lot of our thinking but never really highlighted. And so I'm grateful to, to uh, Professor Soja for having illuminated that. Huh? Um, I think this uh, focus allows for the grounding uh, of social justice in spatial references, uh, and that this insight is particularly useful in understanding social processes in the rapidly expanding Asian urban centers, their peripheries, and their hinterlands. Uh, and I think it raises questions like growth for what, development for whom, 
and in a, a, an overt spatial context, relocation where and why. So in the Asian context, we can see numerous examples of spatial and space-related <coughs> contestation. Uh, but studying such social contestation through a focus on spatial referencing appears to be particularly enriching, or the potential for that is enriching. Uh, for example, uh, there are numerous social movements dedicated to improving aspects of territorial and environmental justice, participatory democracy in Asia, and these appear to be increasing in both number and volume. So the, the dialectic between social and spatial enriches our understanding uh, of, of both sides of the dialectic. Um, the second point, which I find particularly useful in my own uh, thinking on urbanization, is the concept of um, spatial justice and its spatial justice and its relevance, uh, its relevance for understanding social justice in Asia. And I think there's a direct identification and observation of the social actors in this process of lobbying for spatial justice or fighting against spatial injustice. And this particularly enriches our construction and understanding of established and emerging civil society organizations um, and uh, networks. So by awakening and analyzing uh, more rigorously uh, spatially <coughs> informed social and political action, we can uncover the processes whereby the right to the city are actually pursued. And I find that Professor Soja has observed correctly that this right to the city is essentially the right to participate in the social production of the space we live in. And I find that particularly uh, a useful way of watching the coalescence of many of our uh, civil society uh, organizations, not only in Singapore, but in other parts of Southeast Asia particularly. So with reference to Los Angeles, Soja finds many examples of the movement of the concept of spatial justice from an arena of largely academic debate into the world of politics, policies, and practices. And here we can return to the socio-spatial dialectic that the spatial shapes the social just as much as the social shapes the spatial. And I find that this extension of the dialectic into practice reminds us that space practice, um, that, that, that these spaces uh, structure action, and that we must be cognizant of the fact that spaces can both, as Professor uh, has pointed out, can both constrain and enable action. And I think this is a kind of grounding of a lot of activities which become much clearer when one um, elevates the spatial to really a, a, a very open, um, open component of analysis. So in fact, in reading uh, Sojai, I think also in the context of the lecture which we've just heard, um, Soja has, I believe, prior prioritized these three dimensions of spatial justice, that is, the domain of theorizing about the concept, the domain of translating this into empirical analysis, and finally, the domain of clarifying uh, and informing activist groups of new strategies, targets, and tools in their, in their struggles to achieve greater social justice. Huh? So as outlined in his lecture, his own research interest appears to be moving uh, more, I feel, from spatial theory to spatial practice. And the title of his latest book on spatial justice illustrates this. It is seeking spatial justice, not theorizing, conceptualizing, or understanding spatial justice. So I'm attracted to the concept of spatial justice because it is not 
value-free. It is rather value-laden. But Soja also reminds us that perfectly even development, complete socio-spatial equality, pure distributional justice, and universal human rights are never achievable. Thus, he counsels that increasing justice is the aim, not achieving a perfect justice for all. And I think that, that gives the, the dialectic a bit more of a punch and a power. So theory must be applied and actioned. Asia in the 21st century is an exciting, vibrant, rapidly expanding universe. In this period of rapid change, we need conceptual tools to help us reflect on where we have been, where we are, and where we are going. Concepts like spatial justice can assist us in answering the big questions. Growth for what? Development for whom? Relocation where and why? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have some remarks from uh, Dr. Lillian Chi, who is an uh, assistant professor at NUS. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Professor Sojia for sharing his ideas and visions with us this evening. Um, I'm actually trained as an architect, so I'm coming from probably the same angle as your planning students once did. Um, so I, I'll just talk about how I came to your work and where I am in relation to thinking about spatial justice. Um, I was first initiated to Edward Sojia's writings while I was in architecture school in the 1990s. And this period coincided with the height of what is now known as the spatial turn across academic disciplines. At that time, my own understanding of space was limited to the narrow confines of my own discipline, which forefronted space mostly as an aesthetic object to be radically created and subsequently venerated. I was again properly introduced, that is, forced to read closely and analyse Soja's writings in 2000, when I was doing a master's degree at the University College of London. By this time, I had already completed my basic professional degree in architecture. The second encounter with Soja was quite different from the first. Now, for me, the appeal of his work lay in its intense recognition of the role of space in dealing with unwieldy urban issues. Not that space was part of the urban equation, since this assumption was already a given, but that Soja's recognition of space brought with it specific methodologies and ways of thinking about the urban condition which challenged my own training and focus as a would-be designer. From him and his commentaries on Lefebvre, Harvey, Bell Hooks, Foucault, Said, and Gayatri Spivak, I learned about space as capable of generating its own critical epistemology or ways of knowing, and of how we can actively construct our knowledge of cities and rural spaces, the places we live, where we work, play, raise our children, grow old and die. Space in this case was to be activated as a modality of thought as opposed, to be an, as opposed to an object to be distantly interpreted and studied. The emancipatory and radical nature of space, as Soja emphasized, was ultimately embedded in an understanding of space in all its dimensions as simultaneously physical and imaginary, real and idealized, tangible and fleeting. For someone trained in architecture, this newfound knowledge was both exciting and frightening. It gave a political edge to my chosen discipline, but simultaneously debunked many of architecture's stylistic and aesthetic tendencies, including its in implicit allegiance to a burgeoning market economy, popular tastes, and maintaining, in fact, a measure of class consciousness. It resonated with my own emergent feminist politics, but threatened the very basis of architectural designs, unspoken, capitalist, gendered, and class-based foundations. It highlighted architecture's blind spots by shifting the emphasis away from the pure creation of space to thinking about the material implications on the other end of occupying, reconfiguring, and reoccupying space in relation to historical, social, cultural, and economic forces <coughs> around the cities and neighborhoods which define our identities and which we, in turn, shape. In Soldier's recent work on spatial equity or justice, he revises and revises an earlier call for heterogeneous publics 
and the valorization of cultural, class, gender, racial, and sexual difference, amongst others, through civic conscious, space making, and occupation. Reading his book on the same subject and thinking about it within the Asian context, or at least in more concrete terms in relation to Singapore, where I live today, brings back the same sense of exhilaration and anxiety I experienced when I was in graduate school. If then the terms of reference were discipline bound, now they are a matter of real urgency, of being able to come to terms with how space could be instrumental in addressing the inequalities which face so many people in the cities we occupy today. Especially in Singapore, a small country with limited space, no hinterland, and thus no natural resources of its own, the question of space is always a contentious one, regardless of context. But the right to space, or even the right to talk about the right to space, seems particularly challenging in an Asian setting where public participation on egalitarian matters have been largely confined to the state or to select groups who may have a voice because of their privileged positions. Still, the need to raise the issue of spatial justice in Asia currently um, appears more pressing than ever. For the first time in history, the urban population of Asia exceeds its rural population. With advances in technology and communication, globalization, widespread migration, and the recent increase in job opportunities across Asia as compared to Europe or the United States, Asian cities are witnessing a massive influx of people entering its boundaries. The estimation is that Asia's population will rise from 1.36 billion to 2.64 billion between 2000 and 2030. 11 of 19 megacities are positioned in Asia. At the same time, divisions between rural and urban spaces are becoming increasingly ambiguous, while land use is more than often a contested event between various stakeholders, including the state, multinationals, the general populace, and Aboriginal or native citizens who may hold claims of heritage and mythic rights to such spaces. Space, as Soja reminds us, is the potent condenser of these, these changes in its gathering and manifestation of such geographical, social, historical, economic, and political forces of transformation. What is the role of architecture, or indeed, where are architects placed in this search for spatial justice? Can such an idealistic Ambition coexists alongside capitalist structures which support much of architectural development and the growth of cities. Architect Ram Kohas rightly points out that architecture cannot keep pace with the rapid cultural changes in cities since the progress of designing itself could keep a project in the pipeline for up to four years. So increasingly, there is a discrepancy between the acceleration of culture and the continuing slowness of architecture. An architectural historian Manfredo Tafuri cautions that pure architectural propositions are inadequate or in fact useless for radical change. Change we must, but the debate on the future of cities or of their sustenance and desired longevity cannot be interdisciplinary and exclusive. Um, I actually wanted to sh talk about uh, two uh, questions posed by two architects one of them being William Lim and another one his ex-partner taking soon. But seeing that actually the time is pressing, I think I will just probably end here. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Tammy. I'm actually from Hong Kong. Um, my training is more on geography. And thank you so much for your presentation. Actually, spatial justice, I read your book some chapters many years ago. And I think I really agree with that concept, you know, to liberate the people to think about the alternative. They have the spatial imagination about their society and their space, what they want to have the alternative world instead of the capitalist cities. But in order to make the change, we have to have the right to the city to make change to society. This is what I agree. But for me, in the Asian context, I think it's so complicated what I experienced in Hong Kong. And especially when I think about the role of the state, how you, you, know, you, you incorporate the role of state becoming more the tool, almost hegemonic project, and to convince the, the media and the public, and eventually evict the people, and also to, to arrest the protester from the street, you know, to, to, to voice out. This is the first. And also, um, for me, it's, is how you articulate the rights. If you are the local, you want to um, connect with other 
other social movement together to, to incorporate much more multiple ways to the city. How, you know, it is the long term is, I just wonder, is almost have time consuming to fight with the state and also the capitalist developer. This is what I experience, how you, yeah, use the concept and also think about more complicated issues in nation. Thank you. Thank you. Just a very quick response. Um, yes, it's going to be very difficult. I'm not sure if there's more difficulty in Asian cities than other capitalist cities around the world. Uh, but I just wanted to, 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 to mention that the, the, these struggles are not just absolute ones against the state or against capitalism. It's not a matter, in, I, in my view, I, I, I have a very different view about the necessity to struggle 100% against capitalism. Uh, or even the state, but against capitalism, I think the idea is to, we need to struggle to make capitalism more socialist. I don't think we can fight for more cap a, a pure capitalism or a pure socialism anymore. I don't think either one of those works. Uh, and so the question becomes, how do we make capitalism more socialist? This is, this is uh, my anti-binary thinking. I mean, it's not just capitalism versus socialism. But we need to sort of, and it's not really quite third way either, but we need to find ways of, of, of uh, democratizing and making capitalism uh, more socialist. And that's, that's a, an important struggle. And, and the state is, is playing a very powerful role. And, uh, but we mustn't let that split our political anxiety, right? Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a big problem. Uh, but I don't think we should start with just fighting capitalism versus fighting the state entirely, uh, but open it up to a little more subtle kinds of arguments. And Anne Weiss, uh, NUS Singapore. Uh, fascinating. But I, some, I'm glad that Sharon mentioned the fact that you can't aim for perfection, you just get the best. And I'm thinking of a Singapore situation that maybe even makes social, one social development making social spatial justice more difficult. And this is a policy that tries to have home ownership go way down the social economic scale so that you get a vast majority of your voters being homeowners and for many of them, the only capital asset they have of any value is their home. And so every development that doesn't, that might threaten the value of their property, they'll oppose. And we get what's here called NIMBY, not in my backyard, which means that some positive developments get opposed by a very powerful, in terms of voting power group, because it doesn't affect the value, I mean, it does negatively affect the value of my property. Then this can, we've seen this as quite, as creating problems where some developments that are really desirable are stymied because there's such a huge opposition because of the effect on land values. And I think that can be a, quite a problem that's very difficult to, in a democracy, to resolve. Thank you very much. Yes, I think uh, that's, becoming increasingly clear about Singapore in particular. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that the Singapore state has become, uh, although they want, won't describe it that way, more socialist and more welfare oriented as a, as a, as a voting strategy, as a political strategy. Uh, and here again, it's against the idea of sort of absolute kinds of struggles. I think it's possible for, for example, to devise ways to talk about uh, inequality being bad for business, that the immigrant population needs to be addressed even in this 80% uh, social housing in ways that go beyond the housing system in, in Singapore today, uh, that there are, uh, th that there needs to be uh, arguments that, that, that understand the logic and powerful logic of the situation and try to use it. I mean, the reason why this exists in housing in, 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 in uh, 
uh, in Singapore uh, is because of a kind of collectivist ideology that sometimes gets lost. But if we can constantly remind the government of its collectivist roots, uh, that maybe it'll be able to sort of spread this beyond housing uh, and deal with some of the democratic, uh, with these other kinds of issues as well. Uh, maybe through embarrassment rather than through sort of contestation in a conflictual, conflictual way, uh, but, but through certain kinds of strategic arguments. I may be very naive here because I don't know the power of the situation, but I've been hearing what you've been saying very often from several people here now, uh, saying that the arguments, are, uh, uh, that the government just won't listen uh, to these arguments, or they have counter -arguments. I mean, for example, you know, you can't just say that that, that you're anti-government in in in, uh, in Singapore. It seems to me, in a kind of again, hundred percent argument. I read in the paper today that I mean, it's a political ploy, perhaps. Uh, but just yesterday, they decided to add eight billion dollars to the children's health uh, issues support for uh, children's health that goes beyond the usual health support system. And so that the, the you do have a government that is responsive to certain aspects of social needs. And you need to find ways to make the government <laughs> expand some of that responsiveness. It may not be easy, uh, because the government is very powerful, as, as the uh, lady from Hong Kong mentioned. Uh, and in and, uh, and here, it's well, maybe it's similar in, in, in China as well. Uh, there's a kind of strong argument that uh, the people are being uh, attended to. Uh, but you need to sort of make these counter arguments, uh, particularly the idea that some of these new areas of spatial justice can actually be beneficial. For example, again, not only just inequality hurts development, inhibits expansion, uh, but also Regional planning may be democratic and equitable. I mean, in the United States, it was discovered how rigorous the analysis was is an open question. But it was discovered that metropolitan areas that have stronger regional governance have lower inequality levels. Uh, you know, whether there's a causality there, I don't know. But I mean, there are, there are different kinds of things that you can work to take advantage in, in some ways of that particular kind of uh, unusual success that was done for votes, uh, but nevertheless has a kind of ideological foundation that you might be able to manipulate. It's not an adequate answer, uh, and I just don't know enough about the, the politics of, of, uh, of uh, Singapore to give you a stronger answer, except I want to give you an optimistic answer. That's what my intent is, thanks. Hi, I'm a student from Raffles Institution. I just have one um, very short and generic question. Um, Aristotle defined injustice as taking more or getting less than what one deserves. So evidently, justice is a very protean concept. And um, how spatial justice can link different groups that have very different vested interests in the state and in the community, I really don't see how having uh, Spati uh, spatial justice as a term that unites them is going to work out in the first place because different communities view justice rather differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with the fact that different communities view justice very differently. But just what you said, uh, defining justice as uh, not getting your fair share, uh, that's what I think is what is potentially shareable among different organizations and communities that they all understand the logic of space being used in unjust ways affecting their lives. Uh, now, whether this is done in exactly the same way doesn't matter. What I'm saying that the spatial consciousness that I'm talking about encourages the possibility that new coalitions can be built where they couldn't be easily built in the past. Uh, and so again, it's an optimistic answer, but it's one that's very much based upon uh, a spatial justice concept. Aristotle wasn't always that spatial, although I think he was more spatial than Aristotelian scholars make him for. Uh, but we're getting into another, another area. Aristotle 
uh, talked about a concept called phronesis uh, that now is being given a great deal of attention. And basically, phronesis means wisdom in urban management. Uh, that the skills of maintaining and managing a large city uh, is a fundamental social phenomenon that we've forgotten about in looking at science and technology and so on. But that's another Aristotelian side, side uh, step. But yeah, Aristotle's definition, you can take into, into a divisive way, uh, but by spatializing it more explicitly, I'm arguing that you can find in it uh, a potential for cooperation uh, and connection. Uh, and what I call this very technical term called glue to connect these social <laughs> movements together. Willie, you'd like to? Can I um, comment on the two, oh, yes, two, uh, speak, uh, last, last two questions? I think that I want to deal with, uh, in particular, the Singapore situation. I think uh, many uh, government announcements talk about to have an inclusive society to narrow the income gap. But these uh, actions are being taken in some way or the other. At this moment, it's unsure and to be tested how effective those actions is going to be. But I think more important now to come back to, can social justice, spatial justice be applied? But I think the interesting thing about spatial justice is you can actually apply straight away if you want to. If you have the will to do it and you have the you know exactly what to do. And I think that there are issues in Singapore now in uh, in disagreement or contest of how spatial justice can be achieved. Uh, many of you most of you are Singaporeans, you know you have the uh, BBC contest, you have the railway contest, you have the white deck, and so on and so forth. These are real, actual situations. No, this can be acted on straight away. You don't need to wait to see whether action uh, policy in the, can be effective in the medium or long term. So the, 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 the test to me, for the government, is whether they are prepared to act on spatial justice, which can be implied, implicated, which can be acted straight on right now uh, to make decisions on some of these issues which are very much involved with the mind of the public and in, and in terms of uh, expressing the desire to really have spatial justice for everyone. Thank you. And again, what you said before at the beginning, Willie, uh, that how can this government, which pretends to be so democratic and participatory in its housing, accept the fact that it's probably got the second levest, highest level of inequality, income inequality, in the developed world? How can it accept that? Why can't it, it, it must be able to sort of realize that it requires some major diversion in public policy to deal with this <clears throat> fundamental polarization and inequity in the society. Uh, and so these kinds of arguments, as you say, uh, you might call them social justice, but these are also spatial justice arguments uh, to sort of encourage the state to be able to engage in other, other kinds of activities uh, immediately uh, addressing the spatial justice issue. Uh, this, is, this is, I think, I, I was surprised. This is one of the new discoveries of uh, this past year in terms of uh, William's writings. Uh, that I didn't realize that the level of inequality in, in, in Singapore is so high. Uh, and, you know, how, do, how, how, they can, how the state can contend with this? Why isn't it central in the election? People beating it in the newspapers every day. Uh, you know, re repeating it everywhere as, as you possibly can. So I, I'm, very, I'm very conscious of the fact that some of my colleagues are working overtime so that we can have this uh, evening lecture. So let's maybe have one last question. 
Uh, yeah, thank you for giving me the privilege. Um, good evening, Prof. Soja and uh, everyone on the panel. My name is Cheng Ying. I'm a Year 4 Geography student at NUS. So I'm just wondering, because you spoke about um, how is it that capitalism needs to become more socialist. And my curiosity lies in whether or not in your own writing as a planner, sorry, in the planning department, have you actually ventured into the philosophy of anarchy? Because whatever you mentioned just now actually resonates so strongly with the philosophy of anarchy because back in 1885, we have Kropotkin. He was already writing what geography should be because he wasn't talking about cities um, directly, but he was talking about how is it that the, um, the spaces require a flat ontological <coughs> politics. So um, I'm just wondering because um, we talked so much about inequality, we talked so much about... Um, reducing inequality gaps. So I'm just wondering, in your own writing, have you ever entertained the thought of anarchy politics? Thank you. Oh, anarchy. Okay, finally. I got, I, I was, I thought it was a person, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. No, no, I, 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 I think planning, uh, I, I, I used to, against my will, I used to teach planning theory. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and one of the things that, that's clear is that, that anarchy, uh, anarchist, Libertarian socialism, right, left libertarian socialism, which is another word for anarchism, uh, has been a very powerful force influencing planning from the start and to the present. Um, Ebenezer Howard, uh, the founder of the Garden City movement, was a, a, an anarchist. Uh, Proudhon, uh, who influenced Yugoslavian self-management, which Lefebvre uh, uh, was very interested in, uh, was a, a libertarian socialist or anarchist. And uh, many of my colleagues at UCLA, uh, with big signs on the door saying, distrust all authority. Uh, at the time, I wasn't well known, but the, John Friedman was the most well known person in our department. But the rest of the department didn't give him any power, anything, any influence. I mean, everything was designed to stop the most powerful figure from expressing their power. Uh, a good, strong anarchist kind of situation. And I remember reading, uh, uh, and I've done a lot of reading in the anarchist literature. I remember my first meeting with Henri Lefebvre. I asked him in my terrible French, and he had terrible English, so we communicated in very simple terms. I said, uh, vous un anarchist? Are you an anarchist? And he looked at me and said, oh, man, no, not now. <coughs> And I asked him, well, what are you now if you're not an anarchist? He said, I'm a Marxist now, so that I can be an anarchist in the future. <laughs> uh, and so there's, there's a, you know, a very complicated relationship here. Uh, and and uh, there's a, a strong uh, part of, of the history of planning and planning thinking that goes back to the anarchist thoughts, including a lot of the environmental work and Peter Kropotkin and so on. Uh, so a lot of, I teach my regional planning course, uh, starting out with talking about uh, anarchist and, and uh, uh, utopian socialist thinkers in the 19th century. Actually, Ebenezer Howard was more utopian than anarchist. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the anarchist and utopian traditions of socialism have been much more territorial, spatial, than what won out in socialist theory, which was historical materialism or Marxism. Marxism was much less environmental than the anarchist socialists of the, 20, of the 19th century. And they influenced planning much more than, than Marx did. Uh, Marx was not, uh, a pro, or Engels for that matter, uh, were not uh, very encouraging about the potential for planning. Uh, and, a, and with an interest in localism and in the environment, these are very weak in Marxism, uh, but very strong in anarchist thought uh, that, uh, and utopian socialist thought in the 19th century. So yeah, anarchism is a very important part of uh, the whole planning heritage and continues to be. Uh, the students are very attracted uh, to some of the anarchist writings even today. <coughs> And there's an anarchist bookshop in Los Angeles that's very successful, but uh, the problem is that, the, that we've, we've seen only the violent versions of anarchism. And so the popular images of people bombing Senate and killing people and so on uh, to end the state, 
Uh, but uh, what it is is a kind of suspicion of authority and uh, uh, an effort to reduce the power of very centralized authority to, to encourage a wider form of participatory democracy. And if one sees anarchism this way, it becomes uh, looked upon in a very different way. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm afraid that's about all the time that we have. So please uh, <laughs> join me in uh, thanking uh, William Lim, Lillian Chi. Sharon Siddiqui, and most of all, Edward uh, Soja. <laughs> and thank you all. The Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy.